down, but welcome to episode 24 of Totally Tuned In. I am finally here with Christopher Bailey and we are talking about, well, let's see, canceling cancer is the theme and uh, let's just see, let's uh, see where the journey takes us. Thank you so much, Christopher, for joining me. I'm so grateful. Sorry about the technical difficulties. I uh, didn't realize my iPad had to download an app. Well, yeah, I, I learned that too. So uh, I'm, I'm sorry too. I don't, if I'd known that, now I'll know that for the next guest that it doesn't work on an iPad. But thanks for your patience. And sure. hey, it, I, oh, I trust that these things happen for a reason. And uh, I came up with another good question as I was waiting for you too. So oh, <laughs> there was a gift in it. <laughs> okay, so let me just officially introduce you, Christopher, um, with the short bio that you sent me. Christopher is based in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, though was a professional actor for over a decade based in New York, currently working at the World Health Organization in the communications department is what you wrote. I think you're the director, are you not? Of the no, communication? I'm not the director. I am a, a coordinator in charge of the websites. All uh, right, awesome. All awesome. the online environment uh, and the team involved there is uh, reporting to me. Right. Awesome. Okay. Okay. So you then went on to talk about three things that made a difference to you in your life, which are, we're going to discuss those. But I'd just like you to share a little bit, Christopher. Let me share first, because we met on Skype a few months ago, maybe two or three months ago. We connected and had a great chat. And I realized already I knew I wanted to interview you because you had an awesome message to share about how you changed your life around through uh, healthy habits, healthy eating habits and physical exercise, right? Which you can, you can share with everybody. And since then, there's been another unexpected development, right? That, uh, so we're gonna share about that also on the interview and that's, um, that's what the topic is here. So can you share with everybody what you've recently encountered and are experiencing? Well, um, I, I guess it first came to my attention uh, about, uh, Six weeks ago, um, I started feeling uh, intense abdominal pain, and uh, I went to my doctor, and my doctor told me, oh, it's just uh, uh, the intestinal flu that's going around, go home. Wow. So I spent the next uh, few days uh, not being able to sleep and being in um, you know, distress, until finally I went back to the doctor and said, you know, uh, this flu isn't going away, and so he sent me right to the emergency room they, they did a scan, and uh, the surgeon, the radiologist, and the whole team gathered around me and basically said, we don't know what this is, but we're going to have to operate immediately. And right. I went under, you know, full anesthesia, um, not knowing what was going on and, and seeing the, the doctors, you know, the, the look in their eyes of confusion and fear from them. They just knew right. that I was in deep, deep distress. So when I woke up from the operation, I found out that they removed a fist-sized tumor from me uh, wow. that was likely to be cancerous, although they needed to do the lab tests. And um, there was such extensive damage that I, I spent two or three days uh, waiting for a second operation to repair the damage of the first operation. Um, and uh, without food and water connected to all these tubes, um, it was quite a harrowing experience, uh, but right. to make a long story short and happy, uh, the second operation was a success. They were able to close everything up. Uh, I had the added benefit of uh, some liberal use of morphine, so uh, my imagination ran wild for a while, uh, right. and, and my recovery has been fairly fast. But unfortunately, the lab uh, did confirm that I had stage three cancer, and so I my my world has changed. I walked into a new room and the door shut behind me. I'm used to the new furniture. Right, yeah, yeah. That's uh, quite not not very regular news to receive. Can so can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you, but can you hear me okay, Christopher? It yeah, it's dropping, dropping up a little. Oh, is it? Okay, now okay. Can, yeah. Right, right. Okay. Okay. So how did you react, uh, Christopher, when you received that news? And uh, how's that been since you received this prognosis? Well, I, I think, you know, 
everyone reacts differently. Uh, you know, there's always the, the fight or flight syndrome that you've heard of. Some people, when right. they get bad news, they fight it. Some people run away from it. Um, I study it. And so it's a third option that I, I don't necessarily recommend because I think it's an avoidance of natural emotions sometimes. But sometimes that's my way of managing a difficult situation mm -hmm. is, okay, I don't understand this. Uh, what can I find out as quickly as possible so that I can at least better understand what's happening to me right, and figure out? you know, what to do. And mm -hmm. so I, I, in the hospital with my iPad, um, I did a deep dive into uh, cancer research. And I know something about it from my job and from my experience, but I hadn't actually gone into the weeds of the biochemistry of it. And sure enough, um, one of the aha moments for me is as I was researching it, um, I came across some interesting ideas that showed cancer is not just a disease, but actually a natural condition that happens with the mutation of our cells. In other words, the very mechanism that makes us evolve as a species is also what creates cancer. You know, right. so yeah. Over, yeah. Over, over the millennia, uh, you know, on occasion, there might be a beneficial mutation that moves our species forward. But most of the time, the mutations are ineffectual or, at worst, malignant. And that, of course, happens to be cancer. So in some very real ways, uh, you know, cancer is paying the price for evolution. And right, right. it comforted me, but it, 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 it gave me something to hold on to and uh, a frame to think about. Yeah, really interesting. I mean, I've, I've been loving your posts on Facebook. I just printed out, um, I don't know, are they publicly, are they public posts, Christopher? Oh, yeah. Or? yeah. Awesome. So anybody can go and check out. Um, I mean, somebody even commented and I thought that she said it very well. She said your ability to be so deeply analytical and almost detached philosophical, philosophically, even while describing your own situation is remarkable. Somebody called Tanine commented that and I totally agree. I just want to read a little bit out from there. You said, um, you posted a photo of an iris, right? And uh, you said, it's a very long post, but the bottom part was, so in my mind, cancer is not an enemy soldier to be killed, nor is it an invading disease. It is a natural occurrence necessary for life to evolve as it, is, as it has. Rather than battle it, my treatment and mindset sees it more as an imbalance, just as my obesity was an imbalance and my goal is not to defeat an enemy, but to regain my own inner harmony again. I just love that. Beautiful. And then you said, perhaps human technology can make cancer obsolete and unnecessary for our future evolutionary path and reduce our suffering. And I sincerely hope it does. But in the meantime, I have decided that this is not a war, but like the iris, a cycle that I'm a small part of. It's just beautiful. You write beautifully, you share beautifully. And and that really resonated with me because, as you know, you know my background is the work of Byron Katie and I learned from, I was very interested, you know, she's worked with quite a few people uh, experiencing cancer. And, and she said, you know, as long as you're fighting it and making it the enemy, you know, you, you've, you've got to love it. And, and I thought, wow, that's, that's hard for people to hear. And I thought, wow. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's kind of funny because uh, I, I never really went through that stage. Maybe it was because I was on so much morphine in the beginning. <laughs> it kind of dulled the edge, but uh, you know, my own personal way of dealing with problems is uh, to take a step back and if I can, whether it's a person or a thing, to walk around in their shoes a little bit. And right. so if I'm confronting a person who is being aggressive with me, rather than be automatically be aggressive back, I actually try and put myself in their situation to understand them better. And that usually helps me find a, a third alternative. Now with right. cancer, there's no one to put your shoes into or you put your feet into their shoes of. Uh, but in a way, symbolically, I'm trying to do the same thing. I'm trying to look at it from the cancer's point of view, not just my point of view. It sounds silly, right, but right. it helps me triangulate my situation a little more so I don't take it as personally or as fearfully. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And you, you even said it actually, I think was was it in this post where, you know, when the tumor was gone, there was a, kind of a, uh, I felt that this tumor was not an alien, but quite literally part of myself, but working at odds against me. 
the medical equivalent of neurosis. You talk a little bit about there, and a, it was just yeah, just a, just a beautiful description of it. Yeah. Well, yeah. the other thing that happened after the operation, my recovery was quite uh, speedy. It surprised the doctors, frankly, how quickly I was able to get on my feet and move around, and and I kind of uh, willed my organs to start functioning again because. I was actually in uh, total collapse. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the surgery was quite extensive. The doctor told me that had I waited even a day, I we wouldn't be having this conversation now. And, oh. and during the operation, um, my understanding was I even flatlined uh, for a few seconds. That uh, it was uh, as, about as close as I want to get to my demise uh, for a long, long time. Right. You know, you've just reminded me of something. There's a book called Dying to Be Me by Anita Morjani. She, have you ever heard of her? No, no. I'm, I'm going to get you that book. It's very, it's very interesting. And okay. she talks about, she also, yeah, she had a near-death experience, and, which, which you didn't have, right? Or did, did you experience, do you, have you any recollection of? Well, um, I, I didn't have any awareness of, you know, quote, dying for a moment. Uh, but uh, I did have uh, a series of incredibly vivid hallucinations at the time, which I actually recounted on Facebook as well. Right. And, um, uh, and they were uh, quite harrowing, actually. Uh, but afterwards, uh, this is where I think it gets interesting. When I re started recovering from the surgery and moving around, my, my bodily systems uh, were failing across the board. I had severe anemia, my liver stopped functioning, um, the, the, the tumor had perforated my intestine, it was, uh, I, I was in great distress. Um, and so by getting up on my feet, walking around, by working on the play that I just wrote, I literally willed my bodily functions to start working again. And it's amazing mindset. The doctors and the nurses were quite surprised too. They kept seeing me walking up and down, up and down, you know, inches at a time, you know, yeah. very slowly, but, uh, you know, just determined. And uh, once I actually was able to get to reboot my system and to get to a, a certain stability, um, I was filled with this overwhelming sense of well being and contentment that was yeah. like this wave. And what I, I think it might have been several things, but one of the things I think it might have been was the fact that I had been living with that tumor for, for so long and feeling a low level sense of illness for so long that my body forgot what it felt like to be well. Right. And with that tumor gone, even though I was still in distress from the major surgery, um, my body was almost sighing a psychic sense of relief. Right. And giving the benefit of that. Yeah. And so ironically, during that period of recovery, before I started the chemo, uh, I felt healthier and happier than I have had in a, a very long time. And, um, right. and so rather than feeling the sense of dread and dismay that I think a lot of people feel when they hear cancer, I was just kind of enjoying uh, the, the good. physical sensations of being alive. Um, not having any water or drink for three days, that first sip of water was ambrosia to me. I could feel the coolness going down my throat and thinking, oh my God, I need to make sure that, ah, oh, there you go, see if you feel the same thing. Water. Ah. <laughs> and, and, and to try and make sure that every sip of water that I have from now on, uh, I, I remember that sensation, you know? Mm, well, yeah, that's, uh, that's Amazing. I'm gonna. That's one of my questions. Actually, is what is the gift in it, and that's clearly a gift, right? To appreciate. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, you know. Oh, go ahead. I, I have a, sh a shell here, and this. Yeah. I had a major surgery about, I think, six or seven years ago, and I was really afraid. And I went on the beach, which was close to the hospital, before the surgery, and I picked up this shell as, to remind me because I remember thinking, I just wish it was a normal day, and I just had normal problems, and you know, just anything for a normal day, and this is to remind me give gratitude for just the normal days, right? Where, uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, just, uh, and I, I think that's, um, I, I mean, I was lucky in one sense that because it was emergency surgery, I didn't have a lot of time to reflect on it ahead of time. Right. Uh, but I certainly have had a lot of time to reflect on it since. And yeah. I, um, the downside to 
intellectualizing and objectifying it. There's a positive side, which I've described, but the downside is sometimes I don't deal with the very natural um, emotion, deep emotions of the fear and anxiety and anger. And right. so it bubbles up often unexpectedly. Just last night, for instance, it was my first day back at work. I, I'm uh, my doctor was surprised that I was even talking about going back to work at this stage. So uh, the compromise was I, I'm going back 50%. And sure enough, I faced all the issues of budget crunches and tough decisions and all the things that a manager has to face. And uh, I could feel the stress and anxiety rising like a thermometer all day. And mm -hmm. by the time I got home, you know, I, I dealt with everything. Everyone thought he's happy. He's always in the wonderful. Home. And I can't find a bill that I need to pay. And I blew up and it just hit me, you know, like a summer storm. I just uh, went ballistic with lightning and thunder and screaming and tossing things around. And I realized it wasn't the bill at all. It was this uh, pent up emotions that I wasn't letting out. Right. You know? And how do you feel about that? That, you know, do you, do, are you uh, cool with that, allowing yourself to let go like that? Oh, I, when, whenever that happens, and unfortunately, uh, since my cancer has happened more frequently than I would like, um, I, uh, a part of me feels relieved, but another part of me feels deeply ashamed because, uh, you know, I, I grew up in a household where such overt expressions of negative emotion were frowned upon. And mm -hmm. so it, it felt a little bit like um, a, fa a personal failure on my part that I wasn't able to keep it in. But then there was another part of me that said, huh. <laughs> Right, it's energy rising and, and releasing, you know, with never with the intention of hurting anybody else, and just yeah, yeah just, you know. just just allowing that. Yeah, how about self love, self compassion? Is that something you work on during this process? I know that you're into mindfulness. I'd love you to speak about that. Yeah, yeah. well, um, not so much. I mean, may, maybe it is self love, but I, I I don't think about it in that way. Um, uh, you know, five years ago, and I think you had mentioned, you alluded to this in the beginning, I made some lifestyle choices that um, changed my attitude about myself. And you can call it self-love, you can call it just taking responsibility for one's own health and life, um, right. which I guess is a form of love. Um, but uh, I, I guess I, I shy away from the term self-love because it, I, I too often associate it with narcissism and bad things. <laughs> Um, but basically for too many years, I was neglecting myself. I was neglecting my health. I was neglecting, uh, the art that I wanted to pursue deep down inside. Uh, you mentioned okay. that I was an actor for 10 years when I was younger. Yes. And I gave that up to have a steady job and raise a family and all of that. And, uh, I was doing wonderful things with the World Health Organization. I was building uh, patient, helping others build patient information systems in HIV clinics in rural Africa. Uh, very inspiring work. Mm -hmm. But I was traveling all the time. I was constantly giving and I wasn't taking care of myself. And the result was I became obese. I started developing severe neuropathy in my extremities. I developed glaucoma, uh, any number of other conditions related to me not taking care of myself. I wasn't getting enough exercise. I wasn't eating right. Mm -hmm. um, so I made a decision five years ago to change my lifestyle. I stopped eating all refined carbohydrates. I started folding in regular physical activity into my day. And uh, I work at, on the seventh floor at the WHO building. So instead of taking the elevator, I took the stairs. Somebody supervising you for this, Christopher, or is, or is this just all? Well, just, just I just did it. Simple, just, right? It's not rocket science, right? About how we can improve our lifestyle. It's, yeah, it's very simple things. So if someone came to me and said, oh, Chris, uh, I want to have a cup of coffee with you, I would say no, um, but I will go on a walk with you. And it's the same 20 minutes, but we're moving. Right. And 
And it's kind of started a trend. It's gone viral now. So you see all these sort of Socratic couples walking around discussing mm -hmm. business around the uh, campus now, which you didn't used to see, you know, five years ago. Uh, right. So I, I think I've had a bit of a positive effect there. But the, the end result was that in the course of uh, five years, I've lost uh, over 45 kilos. All of those uh, conditions that I described have rolled back. And um, I, I had a surge of creativity that started reflecting in going back to the theater, working with the Geneva English Drama Society here, and um, acting, directing, writing, uh, teaching, and all of it complementary uh, to my work at WHO, which I also greatly enjoy. Right. And so I, I think the result of it is I, I started becoming a whole person. Uh, right, of course, when we're living our passion, you know, that, uh, that calling inside of us, which for you is, is the arts, right? Is, uh... Well, exactly. And uh, I think the irony of all this uh, is that, of course, I had no idea that while I was making all these changes, I had this cancer time bomb ticking inside me. The, the tumor itself, according to the doctor, must be at least 10 years old. Wow. So, uh, and it was undetected despite two colonoscopies because of its funny position. They, they didn't see it. And um, so was there a hidden hand at work that said, Christopher, you need to change your lifestyle because you have a crisis coming up and we need to put you into training so that you can survive this thing? Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. I never heard that. But in fact, that's what happened, that right. in many ways that lifestyle change that I made saved my life. Had I had the yeah. same body and the same mindset I had five years ago and faced this cancer challenge, I probably wouldn't have survived the surgery. Right. Yeah, clearly. Clearly. Was it difficult to make the changes? Was it something that you really had to put all your energy into? Or, Well, you know, that's the funny thing. You know, um, there, there's some very common statistics about the failure of dieting. Right. You know? And sugar. I know that you, you gave up refined sugar as well, which, I mean, that's... And, and most people... When they um, go on a diet, they lose five or ten pounds, you know, a few kilos, and uh, within a year they gain it back and more. That's the vast majority of people's dieting experiences, yes. and and then they go into a cycle of self-loathing. Oh, I'm weak. I don't have the willpower. I'm a terrible person, and it yes. gets reinforced by the stigmatizing attitudes around them. You know, I can remember when I was obese walking into an airplane with my economy ticket in hand and seeing people turn their heads away praying that I don't sit next to them because mm -hmm. I take up space. And that's quite um, deflating, let's say, right. uh, to, to your self-esteem. So I, I totally empathize with obese people. But I also contend that it, the issue is not willpower that knowing what to do is a, a simple intellectual step. As you say, it's not rocket science. Yep. The problem that people can't get their heads around is that sugar is an addiction. Yep. It has to be treated as such. The minute you say, oh, it, you know, sugar is just a nice little food, it's, it's, it doesn't have addictive properties, the, it's just a question of my willpower, then you go into a cycle of self-loathing because it's not that. It's an addiction like any other, and like any other addiction, it has to be treated the same way. You have to go cold turkey for the first six weeks. It's going to be awful. You're going right. to, um, uh, you're, you're going to have um, insomnia. You're going to have migraines. Uh, you're going to be irritable. You're going to get angry at people. Um, and then after that six weeks, your biochemistry will reboot, and suddenly it will be like a veil lifted from your eyes, and you're going to go, oh, my God, that's what life is like. Yeah, yeah. That's, I've never gotten past the six weeks, unfortunately. I've detoxed, and I just haven't managed to. Uh, but you're inspiring me now. We have a question here from Siobhan. It says, Christopher, you're amazing. Can I please ask what the trigger was for you to initiate your lifestyle changes? Oh, well, actually, um, it was uh, my first uh, health crisis. Uh, I was traveling a about 50% of the time as part of my job. And I was getting tireder and weaker and developing all these conditions. I, Like I mentioned, I had severe neuropathy in my feet, which right. uh, for those of you who don't know the word, 
it's um, it, what it feels like is ice cold and burning needles uh, jamming into your feet constantly. You know, uh, yeah. it's a neurological disorder. It's literally your nerve endings dying. Now, what causes it? The nerve cell, the only thing that nourishes a nerve cell is glucose. And like a flower that's given too much water, if you have too much glucose in your bloodstream, the nerves die. And in the dying, they, they start sending out signals of constant pain and distress. Wow. And that's what neuropathy is. Uh, and when I uh, got it diagnosed, I was told by my neurologist who set up all these electrodes to try and see you know, how much nerve functioning was happening. He said that um, I had 80% nerve damage. That means 80% of the nerve cells in my feet had died. Wow. You know, and it, it was quite severe. And, and this is from glucose, really, just from, from the, your eating habits, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I asked him the obvious question, if I stop eating sugar, Will it reverse? Is it reversible? And he said, nerves are funny. Sometimes they regenerate, sometimes they don't. But um, at the best, you can stop the progression of it. And so that was incentive enough to at least try it. Uh, right. So I did, and I was one of the lucky few that actually was able to catch it before the tipping point and reverse the damage. When I went in to have it checked before my chemotherapy started, um, my neuropathy level had diminished 50% of what it was. Awesome, wow. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. and now it's to the point where it's something totally manageable. It's sort of a dull um, numbness that I can block out most of the time. It's not constant pain the way it was before. Right, right, so it was really just um, fear, basically, of the, the pain. You didn't want to tolerate that pain anymore, so you decided, okay, I'm gonna well, that was just one of the changes. many conditions I was suffering from at the time. There was also glaucoma, which is also neurologically or um, uh, you know, related to the nerve system uh, and, the, and it can also be triggered by glucose imbalances in the blood. It sets mm -hmm. off the full chain of reactions. And in fact, I'll put on my WHO uh, hat for a moment. I, I've been very much involved in health system strengthening around the world. And one of the things that really struck me about my experience with my own health is that when I went to my practitioner, I told him all the different conditions that I was suffering from, and they all sent me to specialists in each of those areas who then diagnosed a separate treatment to the, for each of those symptoms. And not one of them said, oh, hey, wait a minute, the common denominator here is sugar. Right. Not one of them said it. I was yeah. the one who actually had that aha moment and put it together. And so uh, I actually threw out most of the treatment I was being given, the drugs, the machines, because uh, it was getting ridiculous how much stuff they were connecting me to. or right. system. And uh, I'm going to try a controlled experiment. I'm simply going to focus on sugar, nothing else, and see what happens. Well, five years later, all of those non-communicable diseases, all of those conditions disappeared. Yeah, yeah. How do you feel about that, Christopher? I, I find that frustrating that because not much has changed really with, uh, in the medical world. I... It is changing, but it's changing in certain areas and in fits and starts. Uh, I think we're seeing that holistic approach uh, sprouting up actually in the developing world. You know, uh, Sri Lanka, for instance, has achieved right. universal health coverage. And part of the way they did it was to have this holistic approach in the local health centers, where if somebody comes in uh, complaining of asthma and the doctor can see that they're overweight, they're not just gonna you know, give you an inhaler uh, yeah. for the asthma. They're gonna ask specific questions like, what did you have to eat last night? Oh, you're having white rice. Have you considered red rice? You know, it'll lower yeah. the glucose levels of your blood. Um, how far away do you live from work? Have you considered riding your bike? You know, and so they actually start dealing with the whole lifestyle around the condition and not just giving them a drug to mediate the symptom. Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so it's uh, happening slowly. And it's, I guess it's, it's financially not interesting for 
pharmaceutical companies for uh, to spread faster, you know, what's happening in Sri Lanka. Well, you, you would think that it would be financially interesting for the insurance companies uh, because it's all about prevention, isn't it? And so I'd like to see the insurance companies get on the bandwagon here and say, we want to invest in this holistic approach because it's going to save us money from having to pay for more extreme measures later. Right. Right, absolutely. Yeah, maybe we'll I say, send them this interview. <laughs> ra ra rather than demonize the pharmaceutical industry, and don't get me wrong, I mean, sometimes they are, are you know, you, you always have the extreme negative examples yeah. like the people who mm -hmm. charge an or, you know, exorbitant sums for a patented medicine that, uh, you know, where there is no price competition for. And, you know, I, that, that's just evil. That's just wrong. But, um, Again, I like to see it from the other side, too. I like to think, well, um, what is a private sector solution for this problem, rather than just sort of a blanket statement that, oh, pharmaceutical companies are bad. Well, right. let's, let's look at the whole system, and um, maybe we can actually use the, the free market to our advantage in this case. Uh, for instance, let's take the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, when AIDS drugs were uh, too expensive in East Africa, um, we worked with, uh, WHO worked with uh, the pharmaceutical industry that developed generic versions of drugs, and we were able to force the prices the price down point. to make them affordable for Africans. Right. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And exactly. of course, right now you're, you're on quite a lot of medicine. I saw you did a Facebook post. You took a photograph of yeah. you, what, how's that going, Christopher, the side effects from the chemo? Well, I, I actually had to make a personal choice on this because I was offered two courses of treatment. Uh, there was a dual drug that was recommended that would um, increase my chances of survival by 90%, but have extreme side effects that would include um, severe neuropathy, possibly permanent uh, vomiting. Um, wow. You know, uh, I, I could go on, but lots of terrible, That's terrible impressive. things. Mm -hmm. And then, or I could just take one of the drugs that instead of having a 90% chance of uh, recovery, it would only be 80%, but uh, I wouldn't have the extreme risk of permanent neuropathy. And after talking with my oncologist and thinking about, you know, what I wanted to do with my life, you know, in the next six months to a year or onwards, yeah. um, I, I made a lifestyle choice. I decided that I would uh, forego that extra 10% probability in order to have a better lifestyle. Right. And I also believe when we're happier, when our vibration is higher, then that definitely helps our healing. Yeah. And, and part of my whole mindset now is, you know, the doctor gave me the choice to stay at home, go on six month full medical leave and just try not to exert myself and to focus on my illness. And I, I can't do that. Um, I think that would kill me, frankly. Mm -hmm. For me, and again, everyone has a different choice. I'm not saying mine is a better one. You know, I can either self-reflect on my own demise or I can focus on creating something. And so I'm putting my energies, whether that's work or in the theater or whatever else, into in whatever time I'm granted, whether it's one month, six months, or 20 years yes. of trying to create something that ennobles all of us and uh, makes me feel like an active, happy participant in this world. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, I, I really believe when we're growing, just like a tree in, in nature, it's, it's necessary, right? To, exactly. Uh, and, the, you know, the, the, you don't cure a sick tree by putting it in the shade. I like that. I'm going to use that one. Thank you. <laughs> Can you tell me about the role of mindfulness, Christopher? Because definitely I know that that's uh, helped you as well. Some of the things you've said. Really? Well, give, give me a clue, because I'm not ac actually sure I know what mindfulness means. That's really interesting. So being present and um, oh, being I, uh, very yeah. much in the now. Oh, that's interesting. I assumed that you had done mindfulness training. No, not at all. Not at all. Wow. I have no idea what it is. Uh, but it, if it's about being in the moment, um, I did have some training, but it had nothing to do with self-help or health or anything like that. 
uh, as I mentioned, I'm a professional actor. Yeah. And I was trained in something called the Meisner Technique, which uh, literally is training people to respond instinctively moment to moment. And this is not a philosophical choice or a health choice. This is purely to become a better actor on a stage. Wow. So uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, if I walk up on the, the stage and I'm the most brilliant, talented person, smart you know, person in the world, and I go in and I pre-plan what my performance is going to be, in this monologue, I'm going to cry on this moving line. I'm going to get angry here. I'm going to look doleful and winsome there. I'm going to be in love passionately on that line. And I can do it extremely well and fully and artfully. But as soon as I get on that stage, if the other actors on that stage aren't anything to respond in that way, I will look insane. So right. what my technique does is it says, forget all of that. Don't pre-plan your performance. Uh, what you pre-plan is you pre-plan your objectives, your stakes, uh, your choices. But once you're on that stage, you listen. You respond. Yep. It reminds me of interviewing. That's uh, yeah. how I like to approach that too. Yeah. yeah. And, Go and, with it. So in a sense, professionally, I was trained in a technique that's for a specific purpose, you know, as an actor. Uh, but it... Um, in, in a way, it's, it's, it's mindfulness. It's, it's living in the moment. It's understanding what you want. It's uh, uh, reflecting on its importance to you. It's understanding the choices that you have. And then at a certain point, letting go of that and responding to what's actually around you, not what you think should be there. Right. Oh, I mean, that's really evolved, <laughs> I believe. Um, I remember when, when you were in hospital and I messaged you, and I can't remember what I asked you, but you replied simply with, well, right now I'm just loving the sun that I can see through yeah. my hospital window or something. And I thought, wow, you know, he's got this. <laughs> he's really just living in the oh, present. Uh, the first thing I did when I got back home after spending two weeks in you know a sterile hospital environment, it was a sunny day. I went to my garden uh, with my blooming spring flowers and I lied down in the sun and uh, put my hands into the earth mm -hmm. and smelled the flowers, literally. You know, right. it sounds cliche, but I, I rooted myself to the ground and let the sun recharge my solar batteries and let the loamy, you know, earthy smell of the soil fill my lungs and remind me that mm -hmm. I... I am a living thing on this planet. I am not um, this machine connected to tubes uh, in a test tube somewhere. Right, yeah, so much about mindset. It reminds me this morning I was driving my girls to school and my daughter said something about, my eight-year-old, about poverty and, you know, oh, I, I, I want to help the poor people and those poor people. And I said, well, you know what, you know, that's, they're not so poor, Zara, if they're, like, you know, able to do that. That's such abundance, right, to, to be able to yeah. lie down and grasp and appreciate it. It's when we don't appreciate it. That's where the lack and the poverty comes in. But when we can see, wow, so much to be grateful for so much abundance, right? Well, I, I remember um, when I took my boys uh, to Africa one time, because uh, Africa to them had become this mysterious place that daddy goes when he's working. Yeah, and so to kind of destigmatize it a little bit, uh, I actually took them along one time. And uh, we, we spent some time in a Maasai village. And my boys were quite small at the time, and they started playing with the other Maasai children yeah. And um, it, it was interesting to see the games that they played, uh, what they would do with a stick and a stone. And uh, there were no computers. There were no handhelds. There were none of the bells and whistles and distractions of modern life. It was just fields of grass, sticks and stones, and laughter. And that's really all that's you need. Richness. Mm -hmm. yep. That's all you need. And the imagination. Yep. Yep. And the laughter was just absolutely intoxicating, the way they yep. were running around in circles, chasing each other's tails, going back and forth, mm -hmm. tagging your it, you know, universal yep. children's games without speaking the language. Right. Yeah. Well, it's funny how we see them as poor and, yeah, they've got, they've got that richness. They don't have the, the, the screen battle that we have. With, yeah. If you measure richness in terms of, uh, you know, your pension fund, then perhaps the poor. But if you measure richness in terms of uh, actually taking the time to 
notice uh, who you're with and how you feel about them and uh, where you are and how you relate to the land and the landscape and the people around you. Well, I think they were very rich. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, all about appreciation. Uh, you mentioned your sons. How are your sons dealing with this? I've seen them on Facebook also. Amazing, amazing. Well, uh, Adults nearly now. I, I, they're, they're pretty adult right now. My yeah. oldest son is uh, in his second year of uh, university in New, York, in New York, and my younger son is just now finishing up his ID and will be going to the UK next year for university. Um, and it, it, it's been tough for them. You know, they don't show it that much. Uh, yeah. But uh, especially my oldest son, who was in New York at the time, his first instinct was to fly home. And luckily, his girlfriend uh, said, well, no, that's probably a bad idea right before exams. Uh, and I supported that, that what would make me happiest, no matter what happens, is that you finish your exams and you, you do what you need to do. And I'll, I'll be there anyway, you know, right. so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But at a certain point, um, there was a conversation with my younger son where uh, I asked him, because he hadn't talked about it at all, really. Uh, I asked him, do you want to talk about it? Because it's okay, you know, it's just a disease. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, well, what good will it, will it do? And I said, well, it depends on how you're feeling. And he said, well, I'm distraught. And I said, well, maybe we can talk about you being distraught. And he says, I don't see what good it's going to do. And I could see in his face the, the fear of loss. And what, what sank into me at that moment was that I was dealing pretty well with the disease itself. I was even dealing well with the pain. I was dealing well with um, even the concept of my life ending. Uh, I, I was thinking that, well, I've lived a good life, and every day is a lifetime, really, so every extra one I get is a blessing. But the fear that I wasn't dealing with, that my son brought up to me, was the fear of abandonment. And I realized that in his eyes, it wasn't just me, a loved one, dying. It was me abandoning my family. And uh, frankly, that's not something I resolved. Um, and that's yeah. my greatest fear. Yeah, I, I can absolutely, yeah, understand yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, thanks for sharing that. That's, um, yeah. yeah, yeah, there, <laughs> there, there is no answers. Uh, well, the irony that. for me on that one is, you know, I come from a family where uh, the male line of my family going way back has a tradition of abandoning the family. Uh, whether that's physically abandoning, abandoning them by running off and doing something else or emotionally abandoning them through alcohol or work or, or whatever else. And so one of what I felt was one of my greatest accomplishments was being there for my family and breaking that chain, breaking the chain of alcoholism, breaking the chain of abandonment. And mm -hmm. I considered that a personal success for me. So it struck me as terribly vicious and ironic that this biological accident of cancer could throw all that away and that I would end up abandoning my family before they were done with me, not by mm -hmm. choice, but by sorry. happenstance. Sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, you know what's really interesting I love about the, the work of Byron Katie? It's these beliefs, you know, I, I'm abandoning them. That's that's questionable, right? Is it true that you're abandoning them? You know, when we attach to that, uh, you know, because... Yeah. Well, I, 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 I can see myself getting into that mindset. But um, if the child isn't in that mindset, then, um, then the pain doesn't lessen. Right, yep. Yeah. And there, again, with the work of Byron Katie, which has helped me a lot in situations like that, you know, I, I need my children to get this. I need them to understand it. I need to rescue them. You know, that, yeah. there's a lot of heaviness that comes with that. And, uh, well, and just simple parental instinct. I mean, it's, it's deep. Yeah, enough. absolutely. I, I get that. Yeah. Programming. Yeah, yeah, completely, completely. That's uh, not, not an easy one to navigate. And um, yeah. I guess... And surrender so, is another... Uh, yeah, 
and and Thank well, I, there there is a form of surrender that I've done in the sense that I've surrendered to you know what what the Arabic world calls inshallah, you know, or kesara sara, you know, whatever will be will be. But how I deal with that, that's my choice. Absolutely. And so uh, to that, in that sense, I I have surrendered to the things that I can't control. Uh, but um, how I how I manage that, uh, I, I don't intend. I, I don't want this to sound like I'm being passive. I'm not. Um, mm -hmm. It's not saying, oh, I accept that I'm going to die. I give up. No, yep. I accept that all of us are going to die sooner or later. But in the meantime, I'm going to enjoy myself and be as creative as possible. And I will tap dance. I will wheedle. I will bargain. I will, you know, get angry. I will do whatever it takes to make that life either as long or as good as I possibly can. But not under any illusion that success is forever or even that's a desirable outcome. Uh, you know, as Freddie Mercury once said, you know, who wants to live forever? <laughs> right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just to enjoy it in the moment, right? Yeah. So let's um, let's uh, end on that note of uh, about the creative. Uh, yeah, actually, I, I didn't get to read these, but your first, you said three things that made a difference in your life was the physical, which we've discussed. Number two, your way of dealing with the emotional distress, which is admirable, I think. And number three is, life is and always has been about creation. Focusing on my art, in my case, theater, keeps me focused on creation rather than defending against destruction. So can you share a little bit about that? I know that you you wrote a play and performed in it a few nights ago, Einstein, I think. Yeah. Well, actually, yeah, it's it's been quite a busy time <laughs> since I've been diagnosed with cancer. And... Mm -hmm. Part of that also has been, I, I was so close to death in this episode that I did kind of make a promise to myself that I would treat all of my life going forward as a gift. And, and to repay that gift, I want to make sure that whatever I do, whether it's at WHO, whether it's in my own time through the theater, is something that is benefiting others, that is, is something that is glorifying or at least illuminating um, what is special about being humans together on this planet. You know, and and I mean that just straight up. I don't right. mean any kind of self-aggrandizing or cliche way. I just, mm -hmm. uh, my choice. Uh, Very good truth. And um, so to that end, um, what I'm doing is uh, I, I wrote a play on the life of Einstein, which actually deals with a lot of these issues of war versus peace, uh, ignorance versus curiosity, um, you know, superstition versus science, uh, all these yeah. things that have become extremely topical right now. And um, actually wrote it with, you know, in the hospital with, you know, enough tubes going in to me and tubes draining out of me. That's where amazing. I mm -hmm. rent myself out as an aquarium or something. <laughs> uh, I still got to create. Yeah. And um, so I wrote this play, and we performed it Tuesday night, and I, it, it was wonderful because uh, this group of about 50 people who came out on a beautiful summer's evening to be in this stuffy, dark little theater, um, I could hear them get it. Uh, they, and more than just laughing at the things that I was hoping would be funny or being moved at the things that uh, I was hoping they'd be moved by, there was, you could feel that palpable sense of communication between the actors and the audience that created a shared reality for two hours. That awesome. They could, in, they could feel fully and could take them to a place that they hadn't considered before. That mm -hmm. some small ways, their lives have changed. Or at least wow. have Will there be a replay, Christopher? I was so sad that I couldn't make it. To... Well, there were some people from CERN who were there, and uh, what they liked about it um, being scientists was the fact that I bothered to get the science right. And that they loved because too many times when you have biopics of scientists, they shortchange the science. They make it more of a soap opera. And this was definitely a drama. I mean, you had relationships and conflicts and, you know, love stories and this and that. But I, 
you know, for me, what were the two things that made Einstein's life so interesting? One was um, science and the other was his humor. And both of them were ways of avoiding or perhaps dealing with conflict. So when right. things were getting bad at home, he buried himself in his work. When conversations got too difficult, he made one of those cute absent-minded professor quotes that everyone laughs about. And uh, He's got some amazing quotes. But in the context of when he told it, it was usually when he was being challenged on something. So, uh, and I found that interesting. So looking at these qualities, uh, admirable qualities of his scientific curiosity and his humor, not just as character traits, but as tactics in how he managed the world and his relationships, that mm -hmm. I thought was a play. Right, awesome, awesome. Is it available online or is there any way those of us who didn't get to see it can see it? No, it's available in my WordPerfect file on my computer at the moment. <laughs> anything else with it. And in fact, um, to be clear, it, you know, it was the first time that I'd actually heard the play out loud. So uh, much of it worked, you know, to my great relief and satisfaction. But I could also palpably feel the stuff that landed like a lead balloon. Uh, so uh, I am going to rewrite it, but I have a very, very okay. clear idea of what that next draft is going to look like now after that experience. Right, and, right. Yeah, so I was going to outnumber the lead balloon. So uh, I, uh, awesome, awesome. Yeah, yeah. So two final questions. And it's, it's what's next? Maybe it's that. And also, who inspires you? Who would you say is a great um, inspiration? Einstein. Well, the, the, <laughs> Well, no, I, Einstein doesn't inspire me. Einstein fascinated me, and yeah. aspects of him inspired me, but he was also a very flawed person. He uh, tended to marry women that he didn't treat very well. His children hated him because he wasn't around. Uh, and so he wasn't just the kindly old absent-minded professor, uh, anti-nuclear activist that people remember him for. All those things are true, but he had a, a more human complicated side to him, and, and that interested me as well, and that's why I did the play. But um, in terms of what's next, what the very next thing that's next is next week I'm going to be doing a uh, reading of a play that I directed last summer called Crimes of the Heart uh, at WHO as part of our okay. year-long campaign on depression and mental health awareness. Right. And when is that exactly? Is it open to the public? or It's, it's not open to the public mm -hmm. unless you message me. You know, okay. uh, but that's going to be at WHO, mostly for staff. Uh, singing a play, uh, directing a play, Jason Men by John Steinbeck, which will be, uh, the performances will be in October, but the rehearsals will be during the summer. And that's a beautiful story of uh, two itinerant workers in California who, whose friendship helped them make sense of this uh, alien somewhat cruel world uh, and how they navigate that in depression era California right. rural ranch culture is uh, a beautiful story. It's uh, a story awesome. of friends. So it's going to happen in October. Any fears yeah. around the effects of the medication and how you manage that or? Well, I tell you, it feels a little bit like uh, walking around all the time with a full glass of water trying not to spill. Uh, I have low-level nausea at all times. Right. And, but to be honest, um, it's kind of how I was feeling anyway since the last U.S. presidential election, you know. So uh, there's not much difference, so I think I can manage it. Right. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much. I could chat to you all day, Christopher. It's uh, just such well, rich conversation. I uh, really appreciate you sharing this. And I think, yeah, that uh, oh, others will really appreciate it too. So thank you to anyone who watched it live. Thanks to all who watched the replay. Please do share it because uh, so many great messages here. And uh, again, thanks to you, Christopher, for being with me for this nearly an hour, I think, or 45 minutes anyway. <laughs> yeah, I'll see you soon. Okay, bye. Bye.